Uh, what happened in West Palm Beach happened in a lot of places. We got hooked on cars. We started widening our roads. Over time, there was so much car use that we started tearing down our buildings to make room for parking lots. Our sidewalks got more hostile. Anybody with choice left West Palm Beach and moved to the suburbs. At its lowest point, 80% of the businesses on our main shopping street were vacant. It got so bad that there was a documentary on drug abuse in the United States called Crack America and was filmed in West Palm Beach. And here's some pictures just to give you an idea how you know, terrible the situation was. Just boarded up buildings, underutilized property, just a downright depressing place. Nobody wanted to develop here. Uh, the city adopted what we call the beggar's mentality, where we would do anything to get development to come in. We adopted a, a master plan. We literally drew what we wanted. We didn't describe it at length in documents. We drew the buildings, we drew the streets, we did renderings of what the places were going to look like, and then we started writing form-based code to ensure that that happened. So everything was about the form. We didn't mind too much about the uses, but it was the form it took that was really important. My job was to change the streets in our 36 neighborhoods and our downtown to match the uh, goals and objectives of the master plan. In a nutshell, it was putting a whole slow blanket over the whole city to slow it down, make it more walkable, um, transit friendly, bike friendly. And so in the neighborhoods, we use these retrofit traffic calming measures, like the little mini circles. Uh, these are called pinch points, where we narrow the road from two lanes to one lane. And this allowed people to, to walk um, on their streets, get to school. So we did everything to make the city more pedestrian friendly. Because we were in the center of the county, there was a lot of people who would commute through the neighborhood. It's not so much the volume that bothered people, it was the bad driver behavior. And so if we could get the speeding down, um, folks wouldn't mind it so much. So we took um, ugly intersections like this with the sort of highway guardrail, and we, we did things like building little roundabouts. Here's a street that we rebuilt for sewer purposes, and we incorporated a narrowing, introduced street trees, and added a few traffic calming measures while we were at it. Whole purpose being in the neighborhoods, get the speeds down to probably 20 miles an hour or less. This is North Dixie Highway, hostile commuter route coming from the northern cities into the downtown. And uh, we narrowed it temporarily with paint because we didn't have any money. And then um, came back with a um, utility project and narrowed it to two lanes with a linear park down one side and we put lateral shifts in the street to slow down the drivers. So on the more commuting routes, we wanted to slow the drivers down to 25 or 30 miles an hour. Interestingly, in this neighborhood, there was a lot of drug dealing, a lot of um, muggings, a lot of vacant property, boarded up homes. It's not the place that most people wanted to live. Once this project was in, we added tremendous value to the community. You could actually go someplace and walk, have what we call natural surveillance, where you could go with a feeling of safety and comfort and walk around. People with choice built homes on the vacant property, uh, rehabbed their homes, and made it a functioning place again. This is Tamron Avenue. It's another big commuter route that goes through the historically black neighborhoods. And we turned it from a four-lane hostile commuter route into a two-lane commuter route with lateral shifts. A lot of the businesses here were disadvantaged because we took all the on-street parking off uh, to make way for through traffic put the parking back on the road, and the area is doing better because of it. This is Olive Avenue, a state road, five lanes wide, cuts right through the neighborhood from the south. This is the major commuter route in from Lake Worth, the city to the south of West Palm Beach. We took it from five lanes down to two lanes, put in some decorative lighting, uh, put on some street trees. Right away, people could cross the street. Uh, property values practically doubled overnight on the side of that road, where folks were building these, um, what we call them spite walls, where people build these walls between the street and themselves as some kind of fortress to protect themselves from the awful um, public street. And by making the streets nice, they can start taking down those walls, start some engagement with the street, and increase the natural surveillance, and folks will start walking again. At the two elementary schools on the state road, we raised the intersection to sidewalk height. And you can see the ramp coming up. The intersection's flat with the sidewalks, again, helping the kids get to and from the schools in um, relative safety compared to what they used to have. 
We narrowed every side street, again, part of our safe routes to school thing, so that the kids had shorter crossing distances. This is our main shopping street. It was a one-way street uh, with signals at the end. We turned it into a two-way street, added a lot of streetscaping to it. It went from 80% vacant to quite a vibrant street. At the end of the street, we had our, our library. Are there any architects here? Okay, you could probably identify the style of architecture that is called neo-grotesque um, out of the <laughs> 1960s era, and we retrofitted the plaza so people would actually want to go there. Most importantly, we two-wayed the street, took out the signals, we raised the intersection up to sidewalk height again. You can see the flush pavement. We added texture, places to sit, and it became a successful place again. We built an interactive fountain. People would come and play in, uh, in their fountain. Uh, they'd want food, so restaurants popped up. That fountain really turned the place around. In this case, we wanted to do some ex an experimental street with no curbs, because everyone told us it was impossible. But we thought it would be really cool if we could do a street where when we closed it for a festival or something that people in wheelchairs um, with other mobility impairments could get around. We rebuilt it with no curbs. There's, a, there's an oak tree, a live oak tree, between every parking space. We put a little white line around each of the parking spaces. We were told by a lot of sort of lawyerish types that if we did this, that uh, pedestrians are going to get run over and it'd be all this kind of mayhem and that people could never park without the guidance of a curb. And, and that was absolute nonsense. This is even in a bar district, and, and drunk people can park. Um, <laughs> So now we have a wonderful, what we call festival design street, that we can close it down and that everybody, regardless of your mobility, can en enjoy the festival without um, the interference of curbs. And we made some pretty inexpensive but nice looking um, uh, bus shelters. This is another state road um, coming into town. It's a one lane hostile street and we came up with some ideas and we wanted to do a different kind of roundabout on a state highway with no curbs. This whole area is on top of an old pioneer cemetery and so we called it Pioneer Plaza because there was no mention the fact that it wasn't such an important place. And um, the center statue will be a monument to the, the pioneer families who settled here first. Anyway, so we came up with this idea and that it, when it is used for public events and the streets closed for a festival or something that people can actually sit out there uh, in the roundabout and enjoy the space. So there's the, the before picture and there's the after picture. And so you notice there's no curbs. The one-way hostile arterial state road is now turned into a two-way low-speed neighborhood quality street. This is uh, Dixie Highway. This road was specialized for commuter traffic for decades to the point where we couldn't really get away with much less sidewalk than that, just to even place the signs. Um, the sidewalks were really, really teeny, and the cars would speed past. And so we, we developed a plan to put this uh, state highway on a what we call road diet, narrowing it from three lanes to two lanes. So there's where the curbs are ahead of time, and there's where we wanted them to be. Here's another example of that same road. The construction is just finishing up now. To tighten it up, widen the sidewalks, put in the street trees, um, slow down the car drivers. This is in the college. This was the big state road just blowing through here, uh, cutting the college in half. Now the college master plan that was done in the 70s called for two uh, pedestrian flyovers over the state highway uh, to, to join the campuses together. Uh, for about a million dollars a crack. They're pretty expensive. So we said, well, why don't you just shelve that and we'll narrow the road, um, beautify it, and actually glue your campus together by getting rid of that barrier effect or fence effect. And so this is the outcome. Um, again, similar thing, raised intersection to, to glue the pieces of the campus together. Here's another aerial of the city. You can see these two buildings here. Those are Trump Towers, Donald Trump's development. And this is when we had the beggar mentality. We gave up city streets here to make a big super block at the end of these streets. And that move, by blocking those streets, devalued everything to the west. We were thinking we were getting value from these buildings, but it actually lowered the value of the whole city to the west. So that one of the messages here is don't give up your streets. They're really important. Here's our street project. After, after developers and investors started seeing what we were doing, just the mention that we were going to do something with a predictable plan would attract investors. At the beginning we had to show them, but after a little while they started seeing the patterns and you can see the uh, opera getting built here and another nice building getting built next to it. 
and this is our road narrowing effort. Interestingly, the county engineers were very conventional, and they said that there's congestion already, even with nothing in the downtown. Now, if you, if you intensify it like you're talking about, you're going to increase trips, and they, they used all the conventional uh, modeling. You're going to just choke the entire city. It won't be successful. It'll be a big failure. Anyway, um, we narrowed a lot of our roads um, and it incredibly intensified our land uses, and we still have congestion, you know? Big surprise. But it didn't, it didn't have that crippling effect that um, the conventional folks um, said it would. The city still operates just fine. Which brings me to this sort of paradigm shift. The whole idea about transportation demand forecast modeling has to change. Transportation demand forecasting model, does it really tell the truth? Well, I think it tells a truth, but I think there's other truths that we can follow and different models we can follow if we choose to. And that's a policy question. Our attitudes about level of service, how important is it? Well, in West Palm Beach, if we had have stopped doing what we were doing because of level of service, E or F, nothing, none of this would have happened. So sometimes you just got to put that stuff aside. And in fact, I think a growing number of people think congestion is actually a good thing. When you look at every successful city in the world, it's congested. To try and find one good major city in the world that doesn't have congestion, you can't. Congestion is the very thing that creates efficient transportation systems. Without congestion, uh, public transport wouldn't work. The opposite, when we battle congestion, undoes all that urbanism and spreads it out like I was talking before during the group discussion about you know, reducing exchange. So we think that congestion is actually very necessary for successful cities and to make public transport successful, even though it's counterintuitive. But that's part of this whole seeing the world differently. So we don't think congestion is the enemy. And I would say that in the majority of cities we work in, it's, it's a friend and actually helps us put in more sustainable planning and transportation choices. If it weren't congested, where's, where's the need? Where's the, you know, why would we do this sort of thing? You know, there's a lot of speed in West Palm Beach in, in more ways than one. And, um, and so in order to, to make the city healthy again, we had to wean ourselves off our um, addiction to speed. And so we slowed down our arterials, we slowed down our, our neighborhood streets and everything in between. And as we did that, really great things happened. And it doesn't really matter if it takes the commuter an extra couple minutes to get into town because place should always trump speed and levels of service. And that, and that was the attitude that we took. And I think it's a growing sentiment in uh, the New Jersey fit and in other circles.